So, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to start today uh, doing something similar to what we did with regression last week. We're going to do it classification. So, uh, see the problem of overfitting and how we can solve it. We're also going to uh, look a bit better at that uh, uh, method we saw last week, which was to have uh, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So, we're going to uh, do that in a more sophisticated way with cross-validation. So we'll start by seeing how to score classifier, then we'll see cross-validation for uh, uh, essentially either model selection or optimizing some meta-parameters where we have to choose uh, which model exactly we're going to train and how to train it. Uh, and we're going to see that with logistic regression and then we, we're going to also see how to use regularization with logistic regression. So the first problem here is how to score classifiers. When we are doing uh, regression, we use this error measure, which is the, the mean quadratic error between the, our prediction and the, uh, the point that we were using either to train, validate, or test uh, our hypothesis. With logistic regression, we are minimizing this function, this logistic loss function. So that is one way of measuring uh, how well our classifier is working. However, uh, this is the function that we are using in logistic regression, so this is only good for logistic regression. We cannot, in general, use this function uh, for other classifiers. It depends on the classifier. <coughs> Another uh, thing we can do, uh, aside from this uh, measure that we are minimizing in logistic regression, the logistic loss, is a more generic score, which is called the Breyer score. This is also a, a mean squared error, but it is between the probability the, our hypothesis is assigning to any example and the class of that example. So this is similar to what we were doing in regression, where we were measuring the difference between the prediction and the value. But here, we are measuring the difference between the probability of, say, uh, the example belonging to class 1 and the class of the example. So if the probability of belonging to class 1 is close to 1 and the example belongs to class 1, this gives us a, a low error. But if the probability is small or if the probability of belonging to class 1 is high and the example belongs to class 0, this gives us a large error. So this is a more generic score that we can apply to any classifier that can give us the probability of belonging to a class. So as long as the classifier can uh, give us the probability, we can use the Breyer score. So this is not quite the quadratic error to the discriminant, so this is not the, the distance to the, the plane, the hyperplane that we are using. This is the quadratic error on the probabilities of belonging to uh, some class. <coughs> this is an example of how it would look like. We have class 1 here, class 0 here. After we train our logistic regression, we have this curve which corresponds to that logistic function that gives us the probability. So it's low on this side of the discriminant. The discriminant is here where the probability is 50%, is equal for each class. This is usually where we put the discriminant. And on this side, the probability is high. If we measure the error, we are measuring the difference between the class label, which is 0 for this one and 1 for that one, and the probability our uh, logistic regression is giving us. So if it adjusts well to the point, it, uh, uh, it has a low uh, uh, error, so a low Breyer score here. If it, has, if it doesn't adjust well, it has a, a, a higher error. A more generic way of, of uh, evaluating classifiers, this would work for any classifier, is uh, this confusion metric. So this can be extended to n classes. I'm going to show this is just the simplest example of two classes. But basically, we have here uh, the, the prediction and the, the class the example belongs to. So if we, our uh, classifier predicts that this example belongs to class 1, or the positive class, and the example really belongs to that positive class, this is a true positive. So it means that the, the classifier correctly predicted what was the, uh, the class. If uh, the... the if it's the other way around, if, if the, the classifier is predicting uh, that the, the example belongs to class 1, 
but it doesn't belong to class one. This is a false positive. This is, for example, if you're going to do some test for, for a disease or something like that, and the test comes out positive, but you don't have the disease. This is a false positive because the classifier is saying it's positive, but it's actually negative. And so on for uh, the other combinations. If you have uh, multiple classes, you can count how many times, for example, one, one class is, is confused for another uh, uh, via the classifier. And ideally, you want these diagonals to have the, the largest uh, count or the largest number of examples. Because this means that the classifier is uh, predicting the class correctly. So from these counts, we can now derive some uh, scores that we can apply to all the classifiers. So the, the confusion matrix not only uh, is useful by itself for you to check which are the confusions your classifier is making, but also to derive uh, some scores that you can use to, uh, to score your classifier. Accuracy is basically the fraction of examples that are correctly classified. So the true positives are those that belong to the positive class and the classifier correctly predicts belonging to the positive class. Uh, the true negatives are those that the classifier uh, predicts that belong to the neg negative class and really belong to the negative class. So these are all the correctly classified uh, examples. If you have multiple classes, this would be all the correctly classified examples across the multiple classes. And this large N here is the total number of examples. So accuracy is the percentage of correctly classified examples or the fraction of correctly classified examples. Then we have these other useful measures, precision and recall, which give us slightly different things. Precision is the number of true positives divided by true positives and false positives. So basically, it's the fraction of correctly classified examples in the, the positive class divided by all the examples your classifier is telling you belong to the positive class, which may include some mistakes. So if you have a precision of, say, 90%, then 90% of the time your classifying is telling you this example belongs to the positive class, it's correct. 10% of the time it's making a mistake and giving you a false positive. Recall is the uh, fraction of true positive divided by all the examples that are positive. So the, the true positives and the false negatives, the false negatives are the ones that are positive, but your classifying is telling you uh, they are negative. So this is basically the percentage or the fraction of positive class examples your classifier is telling you belong to the positive class. If it has a recall of, say, 30%, it means that when you look at those examples your classifying are, uh, is saying belong to the positive class, you're only getting 30% of the examples that belong to the positive class. Okay. So these are three common uh, measures that you can use. Accuracy is merely the, the fraction of correctly classified examples. This generally is useful, except when you have a very unbalanced number of classes, because then if nearly everyone uh, is healthy, then saying that your test has a, an accuracy of 90% may not mean much because it may just be saying everyone is healthy and then the, the other, the people who, are, who have some disease, you just miss them because uh, it uh, it's simply labels everyone with a majority class. Precision recall gives us different things, which is the, the let's say, the how, uh, how many real positive examples we have on those the classifier tells us are positive, or how many real positive examples we could retrieve uh, with our classifier. So sometimes we use some, uh, some aggregate score of precision and recall, like this uh, F1 score, which is the harmonic mean between the two, to get a balance between the two of them. So this is, there are other scores, this is just a, a, a general idea that we have. Uh, Usually when we train a classifier, we have some function that we are minimizing. In the case of logistic regression, we have that logistic loss function. So that is one candidate for scoring and evaluating our classifier. If we can have probabilities, there are measures like the Breyer score, where, can, where we can measure the quadratic error between the probabilities and the actual class. And then there are more generic measures that we can apply to all classifiers, which is just by looking at the results. Another way of trying to uh, um, evaluate the, the performance of a classifier is uh, by 
considering how it responds when we vary the threshold between the two classes. So, for uh, the logistic regression, we considered that the, uh, the classifier would predict class 1 if the probability of belonging to class 1 was more than 50% or class 0 otherwise. So, we put the discriminant on the probability 0.5 of belonging to, the cl to class 1. But we could change that, we could use the, the threshold and put the discriminant on any other value between 0 and 1. So we could arbitrarily decide that everything that has at least 10% probability of being in class 1, we classify as class 1. <coughs> and if we do that, we can then plot the, the uh, true positives and false positives as a function of uh, the, the level of the threshold and see how this graph uh, develops. So if our threshold is 0, then our classifier will say that everything belongs to the positive class. This means that we don't lose any of the true positives. We, we catch them all because the classifier is saying everything belongs to the positive class. But we also have all the negative ones as false positives because the classifier is saying that everything belongs to the positive class. So basically, we are putting our threshold here and everything is red, the classifier is telling. As we increase the threshold, we start eliminating some of these examples. So the false positive will decrease as we increase the, the, the place where we put the, the threshold. So as we shift the discriminant in this direction. Eventually we'll start also losing some of these points here. So we'll start losing uh, the true positive also as we increase uh, the level of the threshold. And if we go all the way up to 1, where the, the classifier will simply say that everything belongs to the negative class, then we won't have any false positives, because the classifier will never say it belongs to the positive class, but we also lose all the true positives. So we can change this graph and plot the true positives as a function of the, the false positives uh, as we change the, the alpha, the threshold here, for uh, discriminating between them. And this is the receiver operating characteristic. This is a uh, um, strange name, but uh, uh, the receiver operator during World War II was the person that uh, 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 examined the radar images to try to detect enemy planes in the, in the US Air Force. And uh, after Pearl Harbor, they decided to do some tests to see the, the relationship between false positive and uh, uh, false negative when, when they meet uh, the, the enemy planes or when there was a false alarm or, in the, or when they could identify the enemy plane. And this is what they came up with uh, and this was a characteristic curve for each operator. So for each person which actually was working as a classifier of the radar image. So that's why this is called uh, receiver operating characteristic uh, for those operators. But the idea here is that uh, if we have something that simply flips a coin and is not doing anything intelligent, we would get the false positive rate increasing at the same uh, as the, the true positive rate. So uh, no matter how much we change the, the threshold, our classifier would not be able to distinguish properly between noise and, and signal. The larger this area, the better our, our uh, classifier is at distinguishing the points. So if we actually can get uh, there to 1 with having a false positive rate of 0, in that case our classifier is really d uh, splitting the two categories without any mistake. So one way of, of uh, evaluating a classifier is to change the, the threshold, the, the parameter for, for classifying in each category, plot the true and, positive, uh, uh, the true and false positive rate, and measure the area be uh, beneath this curve. So the area beneath the, the rock curve is one way of uh, assessing the, the, the performance of a classifier. <coughs> so for this, uh, just summing up, for logistic regression we could use the loss function since logistic regression gives us probabilities. We could use the prior score too. We always have this precision recall and accuracy that we can use. We just count how many are classified in each category. And we can use that if we are able to, to change some threshold. We can get an idea of how well uh, the overall performance is 
by uh, uh, computing this uh, receiver operating characteristic curve. For uh, classifiers in scikit-learn, one uh, practical measure to use, all the classifiers in scikit-learn include this score uh, uh, function. The score function allows us to give a set of examples and obtain the score, which is the percentage of correctly classified uh, examples. So basically, uh, we can, uh, this is the accuracy, and we can also convert it to the error by doing 1 minus the accuracy. This will be the fraction of the incorrectly classified example. So this is one practical way of, of uh, uh, evaluating your classifier in scikit learn. Okay, so now we have uh, these measures for evaluation. We are going to do something a bit more sophisticated than what we did last week, uh, which is called cross-validation. So the idea that we saw uh, last week is that we are minimizing the training error when we adjust the parameters of our model. Since we are minimizing this training error, this, the value of the training error is not very useful to determine if the, the final hypothesis that we obtained is good outside the, the, that training set. So you may be overfitting and then we get very wrong results outside of the set. So we use some examples outside of the training set to measure the validation error. This actually works like a test error. The only thing is that since we are using this validation error to make some decisions, for example, which model to use or how to adjust some meta parameter, like in regularization, then it also becomes biased because we're going to deliberately choose the one with the smallest validation error. And finally, we save a set of points to measure the test error and get an unbiased estimate of how our final hypothesis is performing. The problem with this is that if we are doing, for example, model selection, actually that validation error is only giving us the error for that hypothesis on that uh, set of data. If the, the set of points we use are different, it, it can give us a different measure. So depending on how we randomly assign our data to training, validation and, set, and test, we get different hypotheses with different error measures. So it would be best if we could do an average of this with different data sets and then we would have a better idea of how the model generally uh, performs. This would not give us an idea of a specific hypothesis because we have several of them, but the average gives us a better idea on how the model generally performs on those kinds of data. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to split the uh, data into training sets and the test set. The test set we're not going to use for anything, for any decision, so that when we measure the error on the test set, it's not biased. Remember that what makes the error biased is uh, the fact that we are choosing from several different measures the one that is lowest, and that's what biases the, the error. And then we're going to do uh, a, a cross-validation on the training set by splitting the training set into n partitions, n folds, and then doing n repetitions, co computing n hypotheses, by training on all but one of those folds, and computing the validation on the one that's left out. So to show this with uh, uh, some graphics, it's easy to understand. So we have this, this data. We took out parts for the test, so the test part is uh, not shown here, is uh, stored away safely, and now we have all these points in the training set. So what we're going to do first is we're going to leave out for validation this first block, and we're going to train the model on those points, the smaller ones. So we train on the smaller ones, we measure the error on the larger one. In this case, we have more error on the training than the validation set, but it, it may happen, because the, the large points all happen to be on the right side of the distribution. And now we do this with the other folds. So now we leave out this block here and use all the other points for uh, generating the hypothesis. And we store this value too. And we do this all the five, uh, six, in this case there are six folds, so we do this six times. Every time we leave out one sixth of the point and we train on the other, and we uh, remember, oh, these are five, right? One, two, three. Yeah, five folds, 
So we have these five values here, and now our cross-validation error is the average of these validation errors here. What we are doing is we are not uh, measuring the error on a single hypothesis, but since we are training hypotheses with different sets of points and validating always outside the sets of points, we get an average value of how our model usually performs on this kind of data. So this is a, a better way of evaluating the model by uh, averaging over a different, uh, different hypothesis. So this is called k-fold cross-validation. The k there is the number of folds that we use. Five folds, ten folds are typical values. Uh, one specific example is when we use uh, the same number of folds as the data that we have. This is usually the case when we have uh, a few data points and we don't want to train our model with very few data. So if we have, say, 20 data points, we can do a uh, 20-fold uh, cross-validation. This is called also leave one out cross-validation. So at each hypothesis, we are only leaving one example out, measuring the error there, and then we do this 20 times and average. But this is usually only when you have very uh, uh, small data sets. In general, we use, say, 10-fold, 5-fold, 20-fold, or something like that, uh, cross-validation. <coughs> there are a few problems, both in cross-validation and testing, and also in validation, on the way we split the data. If we have many uh, points, many examples, and the classes are balanced, it's very likely that in each of these uh, groups of points, on the training set, the test set, and the folds in cross-validation, we will have a balanced uh, proportion of uh, all the classes. But if there, the classes are unbalanced, if most of that our data points belong to one class, uh, or if we have few data points where uh, random uh, fluctuations may be more serious, then it may be a problem that, for example, we have one of these subgroups consists of elements of only one class, and this can, can give us very bad results. So one way to solve this is to use stratified sampling. Stratified sampling will also be random sampling, all the same, but we try to keep the same proportion of uh, all the classes in each of the groups. So instead of, uh, say, if you take one-third for testing, one-third of the data points, if uh, the, the uh, complete set of points has 60% uh, one class and 40% on the other, this one third is taken so as to keep also that balance. So the balance between the classes keeps the same on all the uh, subsets. Sub so let's see an example. We have this data set and we want to find the best model for classifying it. So we're going to do, use cross-validation to, to determine which of the, the model as the lowest error, but we'll keep a set of points in the end to have an unbiased estimate of the error of the final hypothesis. So the first thing you're going to do is to load the data set. This is, if you have a, a, just a simple uh, matrix on uh, your, your text file, uh, you can load it directly into a NumPy matrix with the, the load text function. Then we're going to shuffle to uh, randomize the order in which the points appear. This is important because um, in many cases you can have data stored in a specific sequence. For example, chronologically or alphabetically or something like that. And then if you're going to split, say, one-third for testing or something like that, if you just follow the order, it can give you something that is not uh, well representative of the next points that you're going to have. So to remove all those correlations that we are not, uh, uh, that we don't want in our data, it's typically uh, the case that we shuffle the data. Remember that you need to keep the class labels and the features aligned. So uh, if you are loading one from one file and the other from, uh, from another file, do not shuffle them independently, otherwise you get everything, uh, uh, all your data will be wrong. And then we can standardize, we compute the mean of the feature, divide by the standard deviation, and we standardize the feature. Note that when you're doing uh, regression, you are trying to predict the continuous value, and it's also best if everything, both the continuous value and the features, are around the same scale, around one to avoid numerical problems. 
With classification, you are not trying to predict continuous values. These zeros, one, two, and so on, are just the class labels, and it makes no sense to, to modify them. So, in this case, we are splitting the epsilon values, which are in the first uh, column. These are the class labels, and we are only standardizing the feature values. Okay? Now, we're going to use logistic regression, which is a linear classifier, but we want to test models by expanding uh, polynomially our features. This is something that you will not generally do with logistic regression because expanding the features manually and trying to go to higher dimensions manually is a, a lot of bother, not very efficient. And there are classifiers, which we're going to see in about two weeks, that do this a lot more efficiently and more comfortably. So if you want to do this kind of thing, it's best to use something like a support vector machine and not uh, logistic regression. However, for uh, pedagogical reasons, uh, we're going to do this by hand first because this idea of expanding uh, non-linearly to higher dimensions is very important in a lot of classifiers. Uh, and so since we do this by hand in this case, when the time comes, you'll, you'll have an idea of what's happening. If we don't do this, then it's harder to, to understand. Okay? So this is not a practical way of using logistic regression, but it's a good way of understanding how we can uh, use a linear classifier in higher dimensions to classify non-linear. So this is a function for doing this expansion. Our original data has two features, x1 and x2. We're going to expand by adding, say, the product of the two, uh, the product of and the square of the first, and so on. So we, can, we have this, um, this function here that expands this to a matrix of 16 columns, and then we can use a, any subset of those columns. So the first two, the first three, and so forth, and this will be our model. <coughs> Now, we are going to uh, expand all our data sets and split it into training and test sets. We're going to do that uh, stratified, stratified splitting, so we import uh, our features there, we expand with this function, and now we use this train and test split uh, from scikit-learn. We saw in uh, last week how to do this manually, we shuffle everything, we take out one third, we could also do stratified sampling manually, but that's the, a, a bit more bothersome to implement because we need to count how many of each class are present. So we just skip that and we're going to use train and test split from the, the scikit-learn library and we just uh, say what we want to split, the, the features and the, the class label. We say how the fraction to put in the test, uh, 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 test set and we can optionally give an argument of uh, how to stratify the sampling. So in this case, we give the stratifier the class label, and this will make so that the train and test split will try to keep the same proportion of the different values of the class labels in the training and test set. And now it will return for uh, uh, arrays the features for training and testing and the, the class labels for training and testing. And this will be aligned so it, it does not, uh, meet, uh, it does not uh, destroy the relation between the features and, uh, and the labels. Okay? And now we can do cross-validation uh, using these classes, either k-fold or stratified k-fold. I'm going to show an example of both. If you're using scikit-learn uh, for real, let's say, usually you don't do this because scikit-learn has some, uh, some functions where you just plug in the classifier and you tell it to do cross-validation and it does everything automatically. But if you want to use different scoring functions or in our case, if we want to uh, make sure you understand all of how this works and not just use the black box, we're going to do this uh, by hand and we're going to use these classes. So what this k class does is we have a, a data set here, well this is a, a dummy data set, it's just a series of numbers, but we create a cross-validation uh, object, this KF, uh, from the k class specifying how many folds we want, so how many splits we want on our data. And then the split uh, uh, methods on this object by giving the data, it will uh, uh, check how many data points we have, and it will work as an iterator that uh, returns 
each, in each iteration it returns two arrays one for using for training and another for validation so we have these 12 uh, values here from 0 to 11 on the first iteration the, this split iterator will give us uh, the 3, 4, 5 and so on up to 11 for training and 0, 1, 2 left out for validation on the second path it will leave out 3, 4, 5 so the other ones are used for training and this one is left out and so on so this is a simple way of uh, obtaining which ones we're going to use for training and which ones for validation uh, in each iteration <coughs> if we want to keep the same distribution of classes on each fold instead of using the simple k-fold we use the stratified k-fold and the stratified k-fold receives uh, whatever metric you want to, uh, to split and also uh, the values that you want to use for uh, stratification which can be the same thing because it's only looking at the size at the number of the elements and then returns the indexes but in this case since we have more ones here at the end when it leaves out uh, the last element it doesn't leave out 9, 10 and 11 because that would leave out 3 ones at the end it uh, uh, switches the 8 with the 9 so that the 0 and the 1 get switched okay? so, it, so they become more valid okay, these are just uh, small examples but when you have a large data set it's convenient to use these, uh, these options so now we can do this we're going to uh, use the, the prior error if you use the score for cross-validation then you can just plug it in on the cross-validation methods but uh, we're going to use the, the prior error so we create uh, write a function for computing uh, the, the prior score here uh, we receive the number of features this is the number of columns that we're going to use on the feature uh, table where we expanded the features uh, the features which is the X matrix the, the class labels this is a vector Y and then the index is used for training and for validation and this is a regularization parameter for, for logistic regression which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes so we create the logistic regression uh, object, the, the classifier uh, this tolerance value here is just to specify when to stop the, the minimization remember that we are minimizing that logistic loss function but it's doing that minimization numerically so it, it has to decide when to stop the minimization then we're going to train the logistic regression this is the fit method we give it the feature for training and this is all the lines in our feature matrix that are indicated in the indexes for training and the columns up to the number of features that we're using so if features is 5, it's the first 5 columns if it's 6, it's the first 6 columns and so on so this way we can decide how many of those we're going to use and we have to also give it the class label so this is the same thing from the class label vector the ones that are used for training and then we're going to predict the probability of the points that are uh, in all the, the, the metrics uh, and we're going to return the mean of this square error between the probability and the class labels note that we are assuming the class labels to be 0 and 1 otherwise this won't work so we want something that has the probability of 1 of belonging to class 1 to give a low error when the class is 1 that's why uh, we're doing this difference if we have something like class 1 and class 2 or class minus 1 and 1 we'll have to convert otherwise that, that uh, uh, difference will not make sense and now we return two values the mean of this uh, Breyer so the Breyer score for the training point this is the mean of this square value on the indexes for the training point and the same thing for the validation okay. and now we can generate the, the folds and loop and do 10 fold cross validation to determine which is the best number of columns on that matrix or the best model to use so we're going to, to make features vary from 2 to 15 in this case uh, remember that the range uh, it varies all to the integer below the, the last number you have there the reason for that is that usually this is used to index arrays and if you put there the length of the array the last index since we are starting the indexing at zero the last index has one minus uh, is the length of the array minus one 
per setting everything from 2 to 15, we're going to uh, start with the training and validation error of 0, and then we're going to loop over the fault and compute the training and validation error for each uh, of the fault, add them up, and then just do the, the average for this one. So we can have additional code here to decide which one has the lowest one and to plot and so on, but this is just the, the basic idea. So this is what we get when we do this tenfold cross-validation using only the two original features. We have, uh, this is logistic regression is the linear classifier. There are different lines here because in each fold we leave some points out and train on the other. So depending on the training set, the lines will be a little different. But we have a ve very similar <coughs> error on training and validation. If we increase for three features, so now we are adding uh, a computed feature which is the product of the first two and we have some curves when we project back to, to, this, to the original uh, dimension and we can do four, six, nine and so forth. So at some point we, you see that uh, we, we can see here some improvement as the validation error uh, reduces but then we can see the validation error increasing again as we start to overfit. So we can plot this and we have something like this. This is the training error. This is the cross-validation error for each uh, model, for each number of features. And we can see that uh, with nine, we have the best uh, model. So this is one that uh, gives us the lowest uh, cross-validation error. And this would be the, the result with the, the nine features. Okay. So basically, what, uh, how did we get this result? We get it after we select the model. Remember that this is not the error of any individual hypothesis. This is the average over the tenfold. So it gives us a good estimate of how the model performs in that kind of data. However, this doesn't give us a, a hypothesis. It doesn't give us a trained classifier. It gave us 10 different ones because we used the, the 10 different folds. So what we do now is, now that we know that the one with nine features is the best one, we train again with the complete training set. And this would be our final classifier, is this one, trained with everything. And now, if we want to uh, get an estimate of the, the true error for this hypothesis, this classifier that we trained, we use that third of the points that we left out at the beginning. So those were never used for anything are just used now to get an idea of how well this will perform outside the training set. And we get the test error and gives us an idea of the error we, we, we can expect outside this set. So basically, we start by loading the data, shuffling, uh, shuffling uh, usually we normalize or standardize uh, uh, the data so to get everything in the same range. We reserve a test set if we want uh, to have a, um, an unbiased estimate of the true error, and usually we want to do that. Whether or not it's stratified, it depends. Uh, if you are in doubt, you can do it stratified. It's not a problem. But if you have a large data set with well-balanced classes, then it's unlikely that you have unbalanced subsets, because if you have too many points, it, that becomes, has a very low probability. So now, we, the training set, we partition it into n folds to do cross-validation, and we use the cross-validation error to select the best model. The cross-validation error gives us an average over different hypotheses, so it's a good estimate of the error of the model on that kind of data. After we do this and select the best model, we train with all the training sets. We just did the cross-validation and partitions to select the best one, but now we need the final hypothesis, the, the trained classifier, so we use the complete training set, and we estimate the true error on the test set. The reason for this is that the cross-validation error, although the cross-validation error is unbiased, each one of these points is an unbiased estimate of the true error of each of the models. When we choose the smallest one, now it becomes biased because they are sampled from a distribution and they may occur uh, above or below the true error. And if you are looking for the smallest one, it's likely that we are falling below the true error. So the idea here is that uh, cross-validation becomes biased if we use it to uh, select something. 
An alternative to keeping it a test set, if we are not going to select models or parameters or nothing like that, and if we have a small set of data, we could actually use cross-validation to have an estimate of the true error, and this way we are not wasting data on the test set. But note that if we do that, we cannot use the cross-validation error to decide anything. Because if we choose this one instead of that one, because it has a, a lower error, that makes the, the estimate bias. Okay? So, let's see also regularization. Model selection, we are considering different models, so in this case it would be a, a, a logistic regression in two dimensions, or three dimensions, or four dimensions, and these would give us different expressions and different models. Uh, regularization, we all use the same model, but we adjust the way it's trained. So this is the difference between model selection and regularization. Regularization is an adjustment to the, the training of the model to try to mitigate any overfitting effect. One example uh, of a, used, a very used norm for regularization is this L2 norm, which penalizes the square, the sum of the squares of the, the parameters. So basically what this does is it tries to keep the parameter vector as short as possible. We can weight this with some factor, so if this lambda is higher, we are penalizing more and regular, uh, regularizing with a greater intensity. If the lambda is smaller, we, are, we have a lower regularization. So if we, uh, with this parameter, we can regulate how intense uh, the regularization would be. Uh, for in circuit learn, we'll see this later on with support vector machines, but uh, everything is, is uh, standard, uh, the standard convention is to use this C parameter, and for this case, the lambda is 1 over C. So the higher the value you, you give, the smaller the weight of the regularization. This is the, the convention in scikit-learn, and we're going to see why with support vector machines, but basically you have to remember that you have this C parameter on most uh, uh, classifier and re re regression models that you can use to adjust regularization. Now, for uh, ridge regression, in which we saw how to fit those polynomial curves and so on, uh, using the uh, regularization, this L2 norm, it's intuitive because we have this, uh, say, polynomial curve and we, we are trying to keep the coefficients as small as possible. This means that the curve becomes smoother and not as, uh, does not curve as strongly. In logistic regression, it's a bit harder to understand because our parameters here, the, the W, are this vector that defines the discriminant. So it's a vector perpendicular to the hyperplane that separates the classes. And it's not immediately obvious what difference it makes keeping this vector shorter, because the discriminant would still be the same, doesn't matter if the vector is longer or shorter. Actually, the difference it makes is in the logistic function itself, the one that gives us the probability of belonging to each class. If we have large uh, values for the parameters for w, w, then this step here is very steep, because the number here, the, the inner product of our parameters and the, the features, will change uh, rapidly uh, as we change the features a bit. If we keep this value uh, lower, sh the, the coefficients or the parameters for that W are smaller, so the vector is shorter, this uh, inclination becomes a lot less steep, so the, it moves gradually from 0 to 1. The difference this makes in classification is that if we don't have uh, regularization, we allow that W to, be, to have values as high as it wants, 
and so the curve becomes very steep and the, uh, the discriminant can be placed in any small space that is available because the probability function changes rapidly from one to the other. So it could do something like this because there is a blue point here, it can put the discriminant here and change rapidly from 0 to 1 between, uh, in this uh, small region. If we force the W to be smaller, then this uh, uh, change, the step, will be a lot less steeper and so uh, it needs more space to change from 0 to 1. If it would do that here, it will get a lot of error in these red examples because then it will take longer to increase up to 1. So what happens is that the discriminant is now shifted to this region where it has more room to change from 0 to 1 and we get a different uh, placement of the discriminant. So if this is some outlier that would mislead our, our classifier, using regularization would improve classification by ignoring the outlier and moving the discriminant where it has a, a larger margin. Okay. So this is how regularization works in logistic regression. Now let's take say this last model here, the one with 15 features, which we knew was overfitting, so we have a larger cross-validation error, and we're going to try to improve it with regularization. This is the plot of cross-validation, so the code is basically the same. We are doing cross-validation, we are computing the error. Oh, the only thing is, instead of changing the number of features, we change the t-value for the regularization. And this is a logarithmic plot, so we start with uh, C being, um, this is the logarithm of base 10 of C, so uh, 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 smaller C, larger, 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 and so on, but on a logarithmic scale. And we find here that C 10 raised to the 5 is the, the, seems to be the best value for C. And now we can train our uh, final hypothesis with all the training sets with that regularization value and use the test set for. Uh, getting an estimate of the true error. So in this case it performs even better than the best model. Uh, we take a, a model we, which is overfitting, we regularize to reduce overfitting and we get this final result. <coughs> so to sum up this first part, we saw how to score to evaluate classifiers, how they, they perform. So we saw those different measures. Uh, you usually have the same measure that the classifier is trying to optimize if you do that one. If you have probabilities, uh, if the classifier gives you probabilities, you can also use those probabilities and compare with the class. In general, you can always count uh, the classifications. If they are correct or incorrect and, and have those measures of accuracy, precision, recall, and also you can, if you can change some threshold for discriminating between the classes, you can also compute the receiving operating uh, characteristic uh, curve. Uh, for uh, cross-validation, remember we usually set aside one uh, uh, set of points for testing at the end. So this is a set of examples we don't use for anything just to get an unbiased estimate of the error. In cross-validation, we take the training set, we split it into n folds, and then we average the validation error by training with uh, leaving out one of the folds and training with everything else and measuring the validation on that fold. In many cases, uh, you should worry about the balance of the classes in your examples because if you do this at random, it may happen that some of these subsets will get largely different uh, balance of classes. So you can use stratified sampling for that. So for this cross-validation, I uh, recommend reading this section in Albinus.